Oh boy, this is going to be so much fun. Because here we are, students. We're ready to begin our journey into the world of stocks. Stocks are exciting. Stocks are sexy. Stocks are risky. Yeah, nothing's perfect, folks. But what we hope you will see by the end of this certain this chapter and then the next three or four or more chapters is that stocks are where it's at, folks. If you have a long-term perspective and if you have your eyes wide open and don't chase after the next big thing and if you don't panic when the market's fall because there's going to be times when the markets fall. Let's get started. Slide number one. A great quote from a 20th, early 20th century humorist that you may have heard of, Will Rogers. Great guy. Don't gamble. Take all your savings and buy some good stock and hold it till it goes up. And if it don't go up, don't buy it. Very wise advice, <laughs> because Mr. Will Rogers and his generation were privy to the worst bear market in the history of our modern markets, and that was the Great Depression. And so there was an entire generation and a half, 25 people, 25 years, I'm sorry, 25 years, where people were just, well, actually more, it took more, it took 25 years for the market to recover, but it took another 40 years or so until the 1960s when people actually trusted the stock market again at a very dangerous time when, Mar when <laughs> stocks had recovered and then skyrocketed. So it's a cycle, as we'll see. Slide number two. What are stocks? Well, we, we touched on this in Chapter 1, as you remember. They are ownership. In fact... You will hear people talk about stocks, and they will use the term equities, which means ownership. And it, the, the term is really common stocks, but people don't use that term that often. Where does that term come from? Well, it came from the idea that the shareholders in the corporation were shareholders in common. And this started 400 years ago, folks, in uh, England and the Netherlands, when these uh, endeavors, these business enterprises needed capital, which is a fancy word for money, <laughs> resources. And so they would put together a stock offering, a common stock offering to raise the capital. And these individuals were now shareholders in common, meaning every person who had one share had one vote. Of course, if you had 100 shares, then you had 100 votes. And you were to um, uh, profit from the business enterprise, the success of the business enterprise. And you would, uh, yeah, right, exactly. If the business didn't do so well, then oh, you, you lost. So let's read. Stocks are equity financing, equities. And they enable investors to participate in the profits and growth generated by the business liability. I mean, sorry, business enterprise. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> the business enterprise. But, Unlike a sole proprietor, where you and the business are one and the same in the eyes of the IRS and the government, in the case of a stockholder, you are a limited liability owner. We don't often discuss that, but but it's it's something to to think about from from your point of, your point of view. We we as retail investors that are going to be buying, I hope, mostly uh, large companies with their roots deep in the economy. You don't have to worry too much about this. It's just taken for granted. But some people will create these uh, sometimes called sham corporations or they'll buy a sham corporation and then try to hide their assets and then let, you know, let and let the um, the corporation take the take the uh, hit and then they're protected. Well, the courts have ways when you are hauled off the bankruptcy court. The courts have ways of piercing the corporate veil. You might have heard that term, piercing the corporate veil, saying, look, you just set up this corporation to hide your assets, and now you're letting the corporation take the, take the fall 
well, we're coming after you. But that's something that none of us, folks, none of us are going to be involved in. We're going to be buying large, well-established companies, not these sham corporations. Okay, so why invest in stocks? Well, as we've discussed in Chapter 1, stockholders receive dividends, which are optional payments of earnings, and capital gains. Capital appreciation, the price goes up, the value of the corporation rises as the business grows. Are either of these guaranteed, dear students? You know what I'm going to say. <laughs> no, 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 they're not guaranteed. There's no FDIC standing behind you to, to pick up the pieces if the corporation fails. So they are risky, but we're going to learn how to deal with that. Contrary to what many people believe and how many people behave, stocks are not simply millions and millions of worthless pieces of paper. Now they're electronic bits that people trade each day. They represent ownership in real businesses. So if you own one share of FedEx when that or UPS and that truck ride drives by, you can point to that truck and say, ah, there's my well actually it's probably the right lug nut, right? The the one of the lug nuts on the right front tire is yours. But still <laughs> you're part owner of that corporation. It's a great feeling. Slide number, in my humble opinion, slide number three. Over the long term of modern finance, the return from the stock market, as measured by the Standard & Poor's 500, which you've already mentioned we're going to get to in this presen not in this presentation, but in this chapter, in this, in this module, has averaged around 10 to 11 percent annually for the last 80 years. I tell people 8, 9, 10 percent. That's what I tell people, okay, because it's actually higher than 10 percent, but we don't want to get people's hopes up too high. In any one year, though, it is unlikely that the return will be 10 or 11 <laughs> percent. That's just the average. The return has varied from a high of 53.8 percent in the 1950s to a low of minus 43.4 in the 1930s. And the return in 2008 was minus 38.5, one of the worst returns. Yes, 2008 was a very difficult year. And in any given year, dear students, there is a one in three, one in four chance that you're going to have a down market. But it doesn't, it doesn't see it, it doesn't, you don't get 10% every year and you don't get it one, two, three up and then, and then, and then one down. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> you have no idea. In the short term, stock prices are random. And we'll discuss the random walk theory and the, and those, um, ideas about how markets move later on, but you just don't know what's going to happen in the next six months or year. But if the world doesn't end, if there's no meteorite that destroys civilization, tsunami, earthquake, Ebola, nuclear war, disco, whatever, if we survive the next 30, 40, 50 years... We should do really, really well. <laughs> Why? Because as we've said, and I think I've mentioned it to you, the global economy is chugging along the vast majority of countries and economies, peoples of the world have realized that, you know, capitalism might be the worst possible system of economics ever devised, except for all the others. And they see what we in the West, and specifically the United States and Canada have done, and they want some too. <laughs> so, so they're uh, uh, ramping up their capitalist systems. And yes, there are serious problems. We have to deal with the inequality somehow without destroying the the um, the motivation of, of of capitalism. We're going to deal with it. We have to. We have to, or else we'll die. It's no. It's all of us. It's no. It's not a. Uh, it's not an either or situation. We have to deal with how to share the world equity, equitably. <laughs> but at the same time, we don't want to exactly. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a delicate balance, and I think, I think we'll do it. I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very optimistic. Be ye joyful, even after you've considered all the facts. 
And we say at the bottom that the major exception to this one, two, three down, one, two, three, four down was the run up from 1982 to 2000. And why is that? We, we'll discuss that in a, in a bit here. Slide number four. Um, you see this, you remember this slide from, from chapter one? When people tell me, oh, you know, I don't trust stocks, I'm going to stick with gold. Uh huh. <laughs> I show them this slide. And I say, okay, what do you want, right? What do you want over the long, uh, um, over the long term? Yes, if you believe that the world is going to end and there's going to be riots in the streets and economic collapse, and sure, buy gold, but it, it ain't going to help you, folks, unless you're somewhere in Tierra del Fuego or Tasmania, away from the insanity. But look at that! Look at that huge run-up. Now this is this slide is a little tricky because what they use, dear students, is a logarithmic scale. And you should never use logarithms with, with the vast majority of people because they don't understand them. It, it's the reverse of an exponent. Instead of making numbers look large, they make numbers look small. So every time they jump, they don't jump by a factor of one, they jump by a factor of ten. Right? <laughs> this is why earthquakes, people people don't understand earthquakes. When when there's a, a, a category, for, not a category, a, a Richter scale, it's a category for, for, uh, for hurricanes. If there's a, a 4.0 earthquake and they feel it and they go, oh, that wasn't so bad. Eight, just, no, no. <laughs> no. And eight is four, 10 to the fourth power, you know, four, 10 to the fourth power more powerful, 10,000 times more powerful, right? And that's what's going on here. We see this look like a straight line, and there's a couple of bumps along the way, but, but it's not a straight line. It's an exponential curve that's been uh, turned into a logarithm to make it look like a straight line. So these little bumps along the way, they are not bumps. This is when the market lost 80-some percent in the Great Depression. Here's the, the, the 70s, the 72, 73, 74 bear market. Here's the two... The, the 2000 to 2002 downturn, the 2008 downturn. These are huge drops because we're using a logarithmic scale. But still, the news is good. <laughs> the stocks have have given us tremendous wealth, and they've given the world a a standard of living that is unheard of in the history of of, of humans, in the history of of our civilizations. So, so the news is good. Now, bonds have done okay, yeah, but what would you rather have? <laughs> and then short-term investments, well, you know, what, what would we do? And then people say inflation has been, mo has been monstrous. Well, it has been tough, right? And if you've invested in gold, you've beaten inflation, but just barely. But look at, yeah, so, so, so now, now that we know the good news, right, now that we know... <laughs> Uh, now that we know the stocks are the best investment, long-term, financial, we're, we're not going to uh, touch real estate yet. We'll discuss real estate at the end of the semester. It's a whole different world. We're, ta we're concentrating on what are called securities, financial investments. How do we participate? Well, well here's the bad news. It ain't easy. <laughs> it is not easy to pick stocks, folks. Any professional money manager making a ton of money on Wall Street or wherever they are will will tell you right off the bat that it ain't easy, which is why many people will just say, look, I'll, I'll hire a good money manager either through my mutual funds or maybe a financial advisor who will pick stocks for me. But you, dear students, are going to learn how to choose stocks prudently with a long-term orientation and assuming the world doesn't end, if you follow the um, the uh, concepts, the techniques, the, the tips, the skills that we do in these uh, in these chapters ahead, you're going to do okay. Assuming the world doesn't end. Now you might not be as good as uh, the pros and uh, the the best pros on Wall Street. Who is? You know, who's, who's as good as the best? Um, uh, uh, baseball players or, or in the major leagues or, or opera singers. No, but but you're gonna but but you're gonna do okay. I believe. I believe. I can't guarantee anything. But but uh, assuming the world doesn't end, if you if you invest with a long term time horizon, prudent 
uh, companies with their roots deep in the economy, yeah, go ahead, pick one of the hot stocks. That's the that's the technical word, by the way, a hot stock, and hopefully you don't get burned. But but that should be the the small percentage of your portfolio. And we're going to learn how, what techniques to use to identify those speculative companies that could make us very very wealthy, but more likely are just going to lose a couple thousand dollars. And oh well, let's let's try again. And we'll learn how to identify those stalwarts, as Peter Lynch uh, calls them, that help us grow uh, substantial wealth over time. Cool. Slide number five. This is a graph that's a little tricky at first, but it'll make sense after I explain it. And these are rolling 10-year periods. And what we see is coming out of the Great Depression here, there were 10-year periods. In other words, if you if you plunk down a thousand or ten thousand dollars today, what's it going to be worth in ten years? And they're using the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Again, we'll discuss these these averages, these indexes in more detail. But you've heard of the Dow. And so you go to the back to the Great Depression and there were rolling ten year periods where you lost money. You put money in in ten years it was less than what you put in. But coming out of the Great Depression, out of World War II, we see the go go nineteen fifties and sixties. And the stock market went in two directions, up and way up. Science and, and the atomic age. And, and then you heard people say, ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? Because the stock market has done almost 20% over the last two, 10 years. And, and when you hear people say, ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? You know what, folks? It's too late to get in. Yes, exactly. When you hear people say that. Because in the 1960s, we had a time when the economy was just roaring and the stock market had exploded. And what they didn't realize is that the stocks are overvalued. And you know what? The 1970s are coming. And here you are, dear students, the 1970s. You didn't lose money over 10 years, but you barely made any money, right? It almost touches the negative, but it doesn't go negative. And what happened in the 1970s? Well, it's, it's, um, there, there were a lot of things. Uh, the country was, was torn, <laughs> sound familiar, um, over the Vietnam War in this case, and uh, civil rights, women's rights, gay rights. Uh, we had the oil shocks, 1973, and then again 1979. We had Watergate. Disco, I know you don't believe me, but that was a tough time, folks. Men, for a very short time, were wearing high-heeled shoes, or they call them platforms or something. You don't believe me. I know you don't believe me, but it was true. It didn't last very long once men realized they can't run in these things. Uh, but um, but no, no, those were those were those were important events. But that wasn't it. What was it? It was the baby boom generation, exactly. And some of you are probably members of the baby boom. Listen to this. And what happened? Well, there was an explosion in the population. And these people were coming of age. I'm one of them. And we all needed shoes and cars and washing machines and housing and jobs. So it was a very difficult time for the economy. And um, and sure enough, uh, we had a confluence of things. Stocks were overvalued. Uh, the economy was having a hard time assimilating all these people. We had all those cultural shocks and, and uh, the, the war and the Watergate. And, and you saw the, uh, the markets return zero, basically, over 10 years. Well, now what's going on? Well, coming out of the 70s, when the baby boom generation had been digested by the economy, we see globalization, new technologies, computers, software productivity gains, the infernal net, I'm sorry, the internet coming of age, modern communications with cell phones and, and uh, the uh, other mobile devices. And the stock market went in two directions, up and way up. <laughs> and in the 1980s and 90s, you see the stock market almost returning 20% over 10 years. And you hear people saying, ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? Yes, dear students, it's too late to get in when you hear people saying that because here come the 2000s. And, and there were various factors, the, the Internet bubble, the housing bubble, the Iraq war, 
but the fact that stocks were just way overvalued, and then you you go have to go back to the Great Depression to have years where ten year periods where you have a negative uh, return. That was the two thousands. And what did you hear people say in two thousand eight nine? Ooh, is it too late to get out? Yes, dear students, when you hear people saying, is it too late to get out, it is too late to get out. That's the time you should be getting in, right? That's the, when you hear people say, is it too late to get in, that's the time you, well, you need to, to back off and be more conservative. And then when you hear people say, ooh, is it too late to get out, that's the time you should be aggressive. And we'll, we'll come back to this. Warren Buffett says it very succinctly. Be fearful when others are greedy. Be greedy when others are fearful. And sure enough, that was the best time to buy. And he did. Uh, and sure enough, here we are coming out of the great recession and the market's coming back. Now, are we going to do another one of these way up? I don't know. I don't think so. But that doesn't mean I'm right. It doesn't mean I'm wrong. We'll come back in 10, 20 years and see how we've done. But I think if you're going to put a gun to my head, I think it's going to moderate. I think that the... Um, the competition is so fierce now uh, around the globe, which is good and bad, uh, that the, we'll see probably um, a more moderation, not one of these uh, wee up in the air and then back down again. But I don't know. We'll find out. But I'm very optimistic, as I told you. I'm very optimistic. Um, if we don't blow ourselves up, die in our own way, nuclear, we, we, you've, you've heard. Okay, continue. Slide number six, okay. Historical performance. Traditionally, close to half of the return from stocks was from reinvested dividends. What, 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 what? You think the only way you're going to make money is for the stocks to go up. No, 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 no. Remember dividends. They are optional payments of the earnings to the shareholders. That's money in your pocket, and we'll discuss dividends in detail because dividends don't lie. That is cash in your account. They don't send you a check anymore. St stockholders used to expect 4 to 6% in dividends each year. That was as much or more than bonds returned in interest since stocks were considered much riskier than bonds. So if we go back between 1936 and 2008, we see that the average dividend yield, again, average, from the S&P 500, Standard & Poor's 500, the 500 largest companies based in the United States traditionally, was almost 4%, 3.8%. But then in the, at various times, in the 1960s, in the 1980s and 90s, um, dividends fell. Dividends fell because people didn't want dividends anymore. They wanted capital gains. Don't pay me dividends. I want you to reinvest that money in the company and make the company grow. So between 1997 and 2007, exactly, it fell over half. The dividend yield was one and a half. Now, there were various reasons. Dividends were taxed at a higher rate. They aren't anymore. People wanted the business to, to reinvest the earnings for growth instead of distributing it to the investors. People somehow believe that stocks were no longer considered riskier than bonds. Well, again, it's how you measure risk. In the short term, stocks are much riskier than bonds. But in the long term, no, as long as we don't die and the world end. Savings accounts were also paying less than 2%, so who cares? I might as well put my money in a stock. Remember, the savings account is guaranteed by the FDIC. And people lost track of their senses and bid up the prices. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> so... The historical performance in terms of bond and bond yield and stock yield is on slide seven. So we go back to 1960, and you see that that the return from our bonds in terms of interest, which is mandatory, unlike uh, uh, stock dividends, and the return from our stock dividends, were, were they were pretty close to one another, a little under. 4% for stocks, a little over 4% for bonds. And then we get this divergence in the 1970s. What was going on? Well, inflation was, was heating up. The, mark, the, uh, the economy was heating up. Uh, the baby boom generation was coming of age. And so bond investors demanded higher interest rates. And we saw in the 1970s the stock market fall precipitously, so the yield on stocks went up. And we'll discuss that dividend yield formula if the dividend goes up the you know then, then then the dividend yield goes up but if the price goes down that's the denominator the uh the yield goes up and if you didn't understand what i just said don't worry about it but 
But sure, stocks were yielding pretty good uh, returns in the 70s and then into the early 80s. And then we see inflation start to fall and bond yields start to fall and fall and fall and fall. And um, the former uh, Federal Reserve chairperson, Alan Greenspan, called this the great moderation. And we see the yield on stocks from dividends falling and falling and falling and falling in the 1980s and 90s as stock prices skyrocketed until we hit, in March of 2000, the, uh, the uh, height of the market at the time, uh, 1%. Dividend yields were down to 1%. Many companies are not paying any dividends. We don't want dividends. We want capital gains. And we see bond yields still falling and falling and falling. And then we hit the, we have the, uh, the 2002, 2000 to 2002 bear market where stock prices fell almost 50%, not quite. And the dividend yield starts to creep up again, starts to creep up again. And then here's 2008. Bond yields plummeted. The Federal Reserve drove interest rate, in short-term interest rates down to zero. Stock yields skyrocket. Well, I wouldn't say it skyrocket, but they went over three percent. Why? Because the price fell precipitously, and we had a time when bond yields were less than stock yields. Folks, in history, in history tells us doesn't mean it's true uh, in the future, but whenever that happens, that's usually a very good sign for the stock market, right? Because things are as bad as they're going to be unless the world ends. And sure enough, that was a great time to invest in stocks. Bond yields crept back up again. Stock yields went down as the prices went up. And then again, you had this situation again in 2012. Well, again, that was a great time. 2013, the stock market went up 30%. So they've been bouncing along around here, around 2% back and forth. And right now, bond yields have jumped a little bit above uh, 2%. Stock yields are a little bit below 2%. So they're back you know, to the situation where they're in line with one another. And again, that's usually, but not there's not a guarantee, that's usually a great sign for the future for stocks. We'll see. We'll see. Or it just means this is a very unusual time in the history of modern markets, and we're all screwed, and the whole thing's going to fall down because bonds are in a huge bubble, and it's going to burst. You hear you hear this from people, and you know, we have debt up to our eyeballs, and we're all going to drown in debt, and the market's going to be useless, and you, you should go to Tierra del Fuego and, and learn to raise goats and, and grow corn and and, you know, they said the same thing in after the 70s, folks. In the early 1980s, people were buying their gold coins and learning to raise goats. And you know what? That's usually a very good sign for the future. Hmm. It's when people are saying, oh, man, I'm, I'm leaving my job and I'm going to become a stockbroker. I'm going to become a real estate agent. I'm, I, I'm, that's when, yeah, that's when it's usually a bad sign for the future. So the news is good. Slide number eight, the pendulum swings. Dear students, the bear markets of 2000 to 2002 and 2008 have changed investors' perception about dividends. We now see investors and companies focusing more and more attention on dividends. Many companies that never paid any dividends in the past are doing so now. For example, many of the tech companies. You had companies like Microsoft, and now you have um, Google and, and Apple with tens, hundreds of billions of dollars in cash because, you know, they've done really well. And they, how many times can you rewrite Word without screwing it up? And they keep making it worse and worse and worse on Windows. And so they started paying dividends. Microsoft has, paid, has now paid very good dividends. And you know Apple's going to start paying good dividends because they have all this cash and don't know what to do with. Um, the tax law has also changed so that dividends are taxed roughly the same as capital gains, which has been very, very um, uh, fortuitous for the very wealthy and for those of us who are going to invest for the long term. And I love this line. It was a book written by a woman named Gerald Eden Weiss, who's actually based in La Jolla. I haven't heard anything from her. The book's not that very good, but the title is fabulous. Dividends don't lie, folks. That is money in your pocket that... <laughs> you, they can't take it away from you. Once they give it to you, it's in your, well, it goes in your account, but still. And this is a quote that is attributed to John D. Rockefeller. And it, it was actually said by his neighbor who, who said that he said it. So we don't really know if he actually said it, but it's a great quote. Do you know the only thing that gives me pleasure? It's to see my dividends coming in. <laughs> 
Yeah, we don't know that he actually said it, but it's a great quote, yes. Slide number nine. So, to recap, what are the pros and cons of stock ownership? The pros. It has it allows the general public, us retail investors. I usually I call I call ourselves retail investors, and uh, and we'll discuss that later on when we get to um, uh, you know market makers and dealers and brokers. But it allows the general public to share in the rewards of biz, of the business enterprise. It has been the best financial investment returns over time. Dividends and capital gains, not just capital gains. You know, we're leaving out real estate because the real estate is a very different world, and we'll discuss that later on. They're easy to buy and sell, very liquid investment, assuming you buy uh, uh, large companies with their roots deep in the economy. They, whoops, there's a limited liability. Did I, did I, I, just, hit, I just knocked over the uh, microphone, excuse me. Um, and the one thing we don't discuss, but I think I've touched on it a few times, is that this system has created an increased standard of living for everyone in the economy, folks. Yes, it's not equitable. It's not shared equitably, and we've got to fix that, and we will somehow. I, we have to. But still, still, the rest of the world has looked at us and said, damn, <laughs> we want some of that, too. And this is a great sign, folks. You know, people are worried about about those tricky Asians and those Mexicans and and those other people who are trying to steal all our jobs. No, they're buying Pampers and they're buying Coca Cola and they're buying uh, uh, BMWs that are built in the United States. I mean, folks, this is a global economy, and we will either thrive altogether or we will die altogether. It's that simple. You, you, you. You might not believe me, especially in this political environment, but it is the truth. <laughs> okay. Alternative facts, anyone? Anyway, uh, what are the cons? All right, all right, nothing's perfect. I know I sound like an advertisement, but uh, but no, they are risky. They are volatile, which is the industry's popular euphemism for I lost a lot of money. <laughs> When you ask somebody, oh, you, hey, how did that, that, that small company that you bought, how did that do? Oh, it was very volatile. You know what that means, right? He lost his shirt. <laughs> it means he paid $11.88 for it and sold it for $0.30 cents a share. Do you know anybody who's bought a stock that was really, really awesome? I mean, it was very promising with incredible technology, had some great recommendations from people who worked in the, in the company saying, this is fabulous. And uh, you know anybody who bought a stock for $11.88 and sold it for $0.30? Cents? I do. I've known him all my life. He's kind of kooky, teaches finance and investments. It's it was a great company, folks. I mean, really, the technology was awesome, and, and it had nothing to do with the company itself. It was totally out of their control that why they failed. Oh, well. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue, which we'll learn how to deal with by taking a long-term perspective and not buying or maybe buying one or two of these speculative companies that may become fabulously wealthy and for every one speculative company that we buy for $11.88 and sell for $0.30, cents, we buy five General Electrics and 3Ms and Johnson & Johnsons and Coca-Colas and FedExes. You understand? Yes. Okay, we'll discuss this more in detail as we continue. And then, folks, you're not going to get around this stuff. There are people in the industry who are not the most honest there are people in every industry who are not the most honest, and so the potential for corporate and financial industry hanky panky, travesura, trucos, um, gimmicks, accounting, uh, whatever, that's where the money is, right? So, uh, yeah, it happens. It happens. And if we stick with very large companies, then it's, it's not a guarantee. Enron, WorldCom, Global Crossing, Wells Fargo. <laughs> but, um, but no, we will avoid most of that. Now, our last slide for our introduction is a graph that shows volatility <laughs> examined. The industry uses $10,000. I don't know why, but that's what they use. So we start with $10,000, December 31st, actually January 1st, 2016. And this is the Standard & Poor's 500. So you've 
just taken a Business 123 class, and you know that stocks are the best deal, so you get the $10,000 you inherited from Grant and Trudy, and you put it in the Standard & Poor's 500 index fund that we discussed in the previous chapter. And the market, the Standard & Poor's 500, falls almost 10% within the first few weeks of the year. And you say, ooh, 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 is it too late to get out? And you take your money out only to see it jump 12, 13%. And so you put your money back in, and then Brexit, I don't know if you remember that, the Brexit um, uh, um, vote happened, and the markets fell about, you know, I don't know, 4 or 5%. And I, and I, my son was wanting to put some money into his Roth IRA. I said, now's the time to do it, Jeff. And we timed it almost perfectly. We were one day off, but we, we, we hit it, because I knew that even though Brexit was really stupid, and it's going to hurt the Brits, Maybe, probably, if it goes through, if it doesn't go through, or if it, or if they modify it and call it Brexit, but it's really not Brexit, then it probably won't hurt the Brits. But it's something that's going to happen over dec, you know, over not over decades, but over the next five, ten years. So I knew personally that this is just temporary, and sure enough, boom, it bounces back. And then we had some volatility coming up before the election, when there were calls, there were accusations that there was going to be hanky panky in the election which there were but not by the side that was accused of uh, hanky panky and people got worried they got really worried that there was going to be violence because there were people on one side yelling that if their candidate didn't win they were going to take up arms i don't know if you remember this but we have a short-term memory but i remember it because it was very scary and um and sure enough it didn't happen the hanky panky worked for the other candidate and the markets responded by saying, phew, we didn't have a civil war, and the end of the year was actually pretty good. So if you stuck out all the craziness that happened in 2016, you actually went up a little over 10%. Not bad, huh? Pretty darn good. But you have to deal with the volatility. And so you have to calm your emotions. You have to take a long-term perspective. This is assuming you don't need this money in the short term, because if you need the money in the short term, CDs, money markets, savings accounts, treasury bills, yeah, you, you're stuck. But if you have a 5, 10, 20 year perspective, stocks are the place to be. And we'll, as I said, we will offer some tips and ideas and concepts and skills for how to uh, deal with this volatility we can actually use it to our advantage. Well, we did. We discussed dollar cost averaging in Chapter 4. It turns out that volatility is our friend if we have a long-term perspective. When the markets fall, we just keep putting more money in, and the people who do that are well rewarded, assuming the world doesn't end. Okay? So are you excited? I am, folks, I am, I am incredibly optimistic about the future, uh, the near term scares me, but the long term, assuming, I told you this already, assuming that the world doesn't end, the news is good. The news is good. Okay, and our, go back and make sure you understand everything that we discussed in this presentation. In our next presentation, we will discuss the markets. Where are these capital uh, markets located? How do they work? Who are the big players? And um, it's not just Wall Street anymore, folks. <laughs> you don't have to work in New York. That's the good news for people who want to work in the industry. You don't have to deal with that commute or pay $14 million for a two-bedroom apartment in Manhattan. See you in our next presentation.